Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the research seminar organized by the Research Center for Irish Studies at the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, the British University in Egypt. The research seminar for this afternoon uh, is The Letters of John McGarren by Professor Frank Shovlin. Our guest moderator is Dr. Hoda El Hadari. Um, Dr. Hoda is a lecturer and program director of the English Language and Literature Department, Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the British University in Egypt. She's a PhD with first class honors in English language and comparative literature with the Faculty of Arts. She's also a Fulbright alumna. Dr. El Hadri was previously the colloquial leader on the topic of post-colonialism and world literature in the Institute for World Literature at Harvard University. Her main research interests focus on interdisciplinary using different disciplines such as cartography, sociology, anthropology, and cultural studies to examine literary works in an attempt to blur the lines between the different disciplines. She has published two books, Exile and Identity, an Interdisciplinary Approach in 2014, and Historiography of Partition, the Case of the Indian Subcontinent and Palestine in 2020, in addition to her publications in different reviewed journals. Um, Dr. Hoda, I will leave the floor to you to introduce Professor Frank Shovlin and this afternoon's seminar. Thank you so much, Dr. Rania. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Frank Shovlin. Professor Frank Shovlin is a native of the, of the west of Ireland, uh, and he was educated at the University College Galway, where he took his BA and MA degrees before moving on to St. John's College, Oxford, where he completed his uh, doctorate in philosophy. Professor Shovlin's research interests include the Irish Literary Magazine, on which he published a monograph uh, titled The Irish Literary Periodical, 1923 to 1958. The monograph was published in 2003. And also uh, The Life and Work of James Joyce, on which he, uh, his monograph, Journey Westward, was published by Liverpool University Press in 2012. The History of Reading in 20th Century Ireland, The History of the Book, and The, uh, the Work of John McGarren, a writer on whose work he published his third book in 2016 titled Touchstones, John McGarren Classical Style. Uh, and of course, his latest publication on the letters of John McGarren. Professor Shovlin has worked uh, at the Institute of Irish Studies, University of Liverpool since 2000, and he teaches a wide range of material on the subject of Irish literature in English from 1700 to the present. <clears throat> he has supervised a number of PhD students on topics such as history of the Bell Magazine, Lady Gregory and others. He has a special interest in 20th century Irish literature and is currently involved in um, another, uh, actually, uh, McGarren um, book um, on his biography. Uh, he is, I guess, he signed up to write the authorized biography of McGarren. And um, today we're lucky to have Professor Shovlin with us uh, to discuss his latest publication, the letters, the letters of John McGarren, which is the title for today's seminar. Welcome, Professor Shovlin. The floor is all yours. Thanks very much, Dr. Hoda, and um, I'm delighted to be back again at uh, the British University of Egypt. Uh, I spoke uh, some months ago on, on the topic of James Joyce, and I'm delighted now to return and, and speak about uh, my most recent book, The Letters of John McGahern, an image of which you can see here, and which I have a copy here, it's in my hand. It's, it's a large book, as you can see, it's a book of about 850 pages. And it, it, took, me, it took me essentially seven years to, to, to do from, from first conversation to, 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 to publication. So it came about because I was, uh, I was I'd been working on a, another book uh, about John McGahern, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. And uh, John McGahern's widow, Madeline McGahern, uh, contacted me out of the blue and asked if I would meet her for lunch. So I met her for lunch in Ireland, in County Leitrim, where she lives. And she asked if I would be interested in editing her late husband's letters. And she showed me some of those letters. And I, I was very excited by this idea um, because I've been a a great admirer of McGahern's work from when I was a teenager, really. I think I first read McGahern when I was 18, a short story called Gold Watch. And I went on then to read his novel Amongst Women. And I was deeply moved and impressed in a way that I, I rarely am uh, so immediately by a writer. So 
it was a great opportunity for me to work more closely on McGarren and I was happy to, to begin work. So I, I, I agreed to begin editing in the summer of 2014. I signed a contract with Faber and Faber to publish the letters in uh, January 2015 and then really began work in earnest from there. Now, obviously, those of you who work in universities will know that we're busy people, we're teaching, we're administrating and so on. So finding the time to work on a big project like this wasn't always easy. Uh, I was helped very much by a research grant that I won in 2018, uh, whereby the British Academy and the Leverhulme Trust funded me uh, on a senior research fellowship for one full year, which allowed me to really work on this full time and get the book out. Um, Dr. Hada has spoken a little bit about my, my background. Just briefly, uh, again, I, uh, I published on, on all sorts of areas within the general period of the Irish 20th century. Um, so literary magazines, James Joyce, McGahern, um, the, the fourth uh, pamphlet here, John McGahern's Dublin was a, uh, an invited lecture I gave at the Dublin City Libraries in January 2020 and was published a year later in January 2021. And in a way, it's, it's my first attempt at what, what I'm now working at, which is his biography, an attempt to write the life. The period I looked at in John McGarren's Dublin uh, was the period in which he was a, a primary school teacher in Dublin between about 1956 and 1964. Um, so then, you know, Touchstones, the John McGarren's classical style was a book that looked at the idea of influence, really. And one of the things I'm keen to do in today's seminar is, is hopefully to give some early career researchers some ideas uh, about how they might work on the writer, John McGahern. Um, McGahern's papers, the great majority of his papers are held at the National University of Ireland in Galway, in the West of Ireland, which is where I got my, my first degree. Um, and uh, it's, a it's a very large collection of material. It's, it's probably about 50,000 pages of mainly drafts of his work. He was a meticulous drafter and editor of his own work. One of the writers he most admired was uh, the great French 19th century novelist, Gustave Flaubert. And he admired Flaubert's uh, idea of the, the, the writer as a, as a laborer almost. Uh, Flaubert describes his own work as atrocious labor in one famous letter. And McGahern was a tremendously hard worker and very serious about uh, the uh, vocation of writing. So who was John McGahern? I'm conscious that for some people, he may be a new, a new figure. I want to go into some detail about that. He was born in 1934, uh, and he grew up uh, in counties Leitrim and Roscommon in the west of Ireland. Um, his father was a policeman, a, a sergeant. He had fought in the Anglo-Irish War against the British between 1919 and 21 as an IRA guerrilla fighter. And uh, that period of John McGahern's father's life is brilliantly covered in perhaps McGahern's most famous novel, Amongst Women, from 1990 a novel that was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and was made into a, a BBC television series, which you can watch on YouTube, actually. Um, so McGahern's father, uh, after the war, was a rather disgruntled, unhappy policeman. Um, he felt that the fighting he had done against the British wasn't somehow worth it, that the country that they had produced, this new independent Ireland, wasn't the Ireland that he wanted that instead of the British ruling class, now we had a new Irish bourgeoisie of doctors and priests and merchants who were ruling the country. And he, he was rather dissatisfied with this. And we see the figure of this dissatisfied uh, ex-IRA fighter, policeman, coming through in several of McGahern's novels and short stories. Uh, <clears throat> John McGahern's mother, was uh, a woman called Susan McManus, um, and she married Frank McGahern, uh, his dad. 
and she was a primary school teacher and much beloved of John. Uh, the last book that John wrote was uh, a book called Memoir, which is largely about, it's an autobiography of his childhood. And in it, he gives a very beautiful description of the love that he had for his mother. His mother was a very devout Catholic whose wish was for her son, John, he was her oldest son, to become a Catholic priest. And that was something that he thought very seriously about as a young, as a young boy, about possibly becoming a priest. But he slowly began to lose his faith and uh, abandoned formal Catholicism in the 1960s. John was the oldest of seven children, and John's mother died when John was just aged nine. It was a very devastating moment in his life. His mother and father had a, a kind of strange domestic arrangement in that his, they lived separately. Uh, so John lived with, John and his siblings lived with their mother um, in County Leitrim where she was teaching. And his father lived about 30 miles away in County Roscommon in the police barracks in a place called Coot Hall in County Roscommon. Um, after his mother's death, John and the family, the children, moved in with their father in the barracks. And his father was a very difficult, um, cantankerous, violent man. And the, the figure of that, that difficult childhood, that idea of that difficult childhood, appears right across McGahern's work. I think probably the day that his mother died is, is the most important day of his life. I think it it uh, affects everything that happens to him afterwards. The picture on the left here is of John in um, an apartment in Paris in 1969. This apartment belonged to Madeleine, a woman called Madeleine Green, an American woman who he had first met in New York in 1966 when he was promoting his second novel, The Dark, and uh, who they met again in London in, in autumn of 1967, and they became lovers and later uh, husband and wife from 1973 onwards. John had already been married uh, to a Finnish theatre director named Anaki Laxi in a rather unsuccessful, uh, brief and unhappy marriage between 1964 um, and they formally divorced, I think, in 1971. But the marriage was essentially over by, I would say, about 67, 68. Um, so here we have him in Paris in 69, in this apartment that belonged to Madeleine Green, who was an American. She was from New York. And Madeleine is still alive. And I work very closely with her on all of my McGarham projects. And it was she that asked me to edit the letters. She's 87 and healthy and has a wonderful memory, which has been tremendously useful to me as a researcher. The picture on the right is, is John much later. Um, he dies in 2006 uh, of cancer. Uh, he lives most of his life after the mid 1970s in uh, a small, a very small rural house in County Leitrim. Um, not easy to find uh, between the villages of Mohol and Balnamor uh, along a little side road and overlooking a lake. His last novel, which is called That They May Face the Rising Sun, which was published in 2002, paints a vivid and brilliant picture of the life that he lived in that cottage and of his neighbors and of country life and of the changing of the seasons, the natural world. And it's, it's, it's of those sorts of descriptions that he's perhaps most famous for. He had a very successful writing life. Um, his first novel, The Barracks, which I'll come back to in a moment, was published in 1963. Then onward to The Dark, 1965, The Leave Taking, 74, The Pornographer, 79, Amongst Women, 1990, and That They May Face the Rising Sun, his final novel in 2002. He also published four collections of short stories. Um, and by the time of his death, he was Ireland's most acclaimed writer of fiction. And I think in general, he would be seen as Ireland's most important fiction writer after Joyce and Beckett. So he was of the same generation 
uh, if we look at the Irish poetry world in the same period, he was of the same generation as Seamus Heaney. Heaney, who won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1995, whom McGahern knew very well. There are about 30 letters in the McGahern letters to Seamus Heaney, and there's a lively correspondence between them. So of that generation, really the post-war Irish writing generation, I, I would say Heaney is seen as the leading poet and McGahern as the leading writer of fiction. Um, OK, I, I'll just talk a little bit now about finding letters and using them. Um, I was lucky in that Madeline was able to uh, give me access to about 200 letters that were in her house uh, as a starting point. And they were a great help to me. But, but then there were letters scattered all over the world. The, the, the letter here is a letter that you can find in the University of Indiana in the Lilly Library. And it is to an Irish painter and friend of McGahern's called Patrick or Paddy Swift. Paddy Swift was the editor of a London literary magazine called X, which only ran for seven issues. But it was a very high quality magazine. Um, and it was, it was as interested in the visual arts as it was in, in writing. So for instance, it became an important promoter of uh, people like Francis Bacon in the, in the painting scene. Um, at, it was the first place to publish anything of John McGarren's. It published an extract from a novel he was working on in 1961. And you can see in the handwriting here, the handwriting here is quite nice. It's, it's quite, uh, it's cursive, it's careful. Dear Paddy, I'm sending you uh, I say it's easy to read and all of a sudden I can't read it. But you can see it's quite, it's quite pretty. And he says in the, in the third paragraph that he's working on a novel that he's going to call The Grindstone. I would like to call it when finished The Grindstone. Now, he didn't call it The Grindstone. And in fact, the extract from the novel that X published, uh, that novel never appeared. You can find it in Galway, the complete novel, unpublished is in is in the among the papers in Galway and he called it the end or the beginning of love. Um, he felt it wasn't good enough. Um, it's a little bit like what James Joyce did with a portrait of the artist as a young man. Those of you who, who have studied Joyce will know that that novel began life as a different novel called Stephen Hero, which which Joyce felt was too revealing of himself. And I think McGahern also felt that the novel he was working on was too revealing of himself, and he never published it. Um, so that's an early example of uh, a letter to Paddy Swift. His handwriting changes dramatically then as he gets older. So this is, this is the handwriting I'm more accustomed to. He became friendly with uh, the Irish novelist Colm Tobin, who probably now is Ireland's best known and most successful novelist. Colm Tobin uh, was very generous in sharing his letters uh, with me. And if you're interested um, in, in this relationship, Tobin actually reviews um, this book, The Letters of John McGahern, in the London Review of Books, which you can easily find online, his review, his long review essay about the book and about his friendship with McGahern. And there's also a podcast available of uh, Colm Tobin talking about the book via the London Review of Books website, if you care to go and, and look for that. Um, so this, this, is, this is his later handwriting. As you can see, it's smaller, it's more jagged. I think it's more difficult to read. I've become very used to reading it, so I can get through it. And there were very few words throughout that I couldn't read. John McGahan very rarely types anything, which was difficult for me. He didn't like typing. He preferred to stick to handwriting. Same when he's writing his books. So he writes his books longhand, and then usually uh, Madeline, um, his wife, typed them. Um, and they were a very, it was a very important partnership. I don't think that McGahern could have thrived in the way that he did had he not met Madeline and had they not had that very successful um, marriage. His first novel, The Barracks, published in 1963, was about his life in this building. This is an old police station or barracks in 
rural Ireland, where his father was the sergeant. And he, McGahern and his six siblings all grew up in this house. Now it's no longer a police station. It has become a, uh, a community hub and a, a kind of McGahern centre. So the picture on the bottom right there is uh, of the, the barracks as it is today with large photographs uh, across McGahern's life, samples of his work and so on. Um, the Barracks is a novel uh, about a, a, a woman who is um, rather unhappily married to a policeman. And her name is Elizabeth Regan, and she has cancer. And the, the book is about her, her last months and her, her thoughts about how to deal with cancer, what, what will happen to the children. And you can see that it's very much influenced by the events of Bergerhard's own life. His own mother had died when he was nine of breast cancer. And he's trying to get inside the mind of a woman in that position. And it's a remarkable novel. It's a remarkable debut. And I think it speaks very highly of McGahern that he decided not to publish that first novel, that they, uh, the um, end or the beginning of love, because he felt it wasn't strong enough. This is a much, much stronger piece of work. Um, after the, the, his extract appeared in that literary magazine, X, it was, that extract was seen by uh, the editor at Faber and Faber. And Faber and Faber was then probably, and still is in many ways, the most prestigious London publisher. And the editor there was a man called Charles Monteith, who was from the north of Ireland. A uh, very interesting man in his own regard, and I'll, I'll come back and speak about him in a few moments. Uh, and Monteith had a brilliant talent for, for spotting new young writers. So he got McGahern to come to Faber. He got Seamus Heaney to come to Faber. Uh, and, and Heaney's first collection, Death of a Naturalist, is published by Faber three years after the barracks. And lots of other writers. He worked with many of the great British writers of the period also, people like Philip Larkin, Ted Hughes, uh, and so on. OK, I, I'm going to look at a few samples of letters now. Um, I, there are, I think there are about 1,300 letters in the book. So there's only so much I can do. I'll, I'll, I'll look just a few that, that illustrate, I think, important moments in McGarren's life. McGarren's second novel, The Dark, was published in 1965. And it became infamous because it was banned by the Irish Censorship Board. And it became the last major work by an Irish writer to be banned by the Censorship Board. It was banned because it was, it was felt to be obscene. The book uh, describes the coming of age of uh, a boy in rural Ireland, um, including his sexual coming of age. So there are, there are parts of the novel that are sexually explicit. There are also parts of the novel that point towards sexual abuse, both by the boy's father and uh, in one scene by a Catholic priest. And McGarren was the very first Irish writer, or indeed perhaps the very first Irish man or woman, to, to write about the abuse of the Catholic Church, the sexual, sexual abuse within the Catholic Church. Ireland was still a, a deeply religious and Catholic country at the time, and it, the dark was banned. Uh, that it was considered unacceptable to write this kind of material. Um, but not alone did the book get banned. As a result of the book being banned, McGarren was then fired from his job as a primary school teacher in a Catholic boys school in Dublin. And he left the country uh, and went and lived in London and Paris and the United States for a period. Uh, he didn't return to live in Ireland uh, until late 1970 for a while. So this letter is to his American editor. His American editor was a man called Patrick Gregory, and he was an editor at Knopf. Uh, John's first novel, The Barracks, had been published by Macmillan in New York and by Faber in London. His second novel, The Dark, was published by Knopf in New York and Faber in London. He's, in terms of his British publishing history, he stayed with Faber throughout, but his American publishing history is very complex. Um, 
he had offered the dark to Macmillan in New York, but they had rejected it. They thought it was, they said it was, it made the skin creep, that it was completely unpublishable. There was no way they would risk publishing it. So he gets a publisher with Knopf, who are a good publisher, you know, big, powerful New York publisher. And so Patrick Gregory, he's writing to him here, telling him about what happened about losing his job. Dear Patrick, it's a long and mostly boring story. I'll try to shorten it. The 8th of May, telegram to phone them. Them is the school authorities, that the school that he was working in. It was to tell me not to come. I didn't telephone and presented myself for work. They were very afraid, the teachers. The headmaster read me a note that I was suspended until the priest interviewed me. Uh, pre priests were the, 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 the controllers of these Catholic schools. Um, this would have to be after the 6th of November, end of his holidays. I then saw the union. They were willing to fight sacking on the grounds of dark, but not on a civil marriage. I do not think I could go through the farce of a ceremony. Cage Anu here. Just so, to explain a bit, Anu is his Finnish wife, who he had married in a registry office in Helsinki in November 1964. So, the Catholic Church did not recognize that marriage. Uh, they would only recognize a marriage that took place in a Catholic Church. So as far as they were concerned, he was living, as, as the church would say, in sin with this Finnish woman. As well as that, he had published this obscene book. So they were out to get him on two counts. I do not think I could go through the farce of a ceremony. Cage Anu here, bow my head, work humbly for them and live with myself and work with myself. Anu doesn't want to go through with it either, and she doesn't want to live in Dublin, which I want, but it seems impossible. It seems it must be the woman's land of London. So I meet Anu in London tomorrow. We'll decide over the days what to do. I'll then go to see the priest after November the 6th and probably get sacked. Nothing now can affect my work. It grows only more clear. This journey into my changing self in search of style but physically and financially, it cannot be as easy in London as it was, but that only lies down beside the first. So I, I think it's interesting in that final paragraph that he has this inner strength that he knows my writing is going to continue. I, 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 this, is, this, is a, this has been a, a crisis in my life. I've lost my job. I'm leaving the country. But he says that his work grows only more clear. And I think he always had that inner strength throughout his life. And you see it coming through in lots of the letters. One of my favorite letters in the book and, uh, is to his sister, Dimpna. And I think his, the letters to Dimpna are amongst the very best because they're amongst the most open. This is a photograph of John and his family. His father, the policeman, Frank, is standing behind there. And I think this must be the day of the first Holy Communion of his twin sisters, Rosaline and Breege, in their communion outfits. And you can see they're all in a position of prayer. John, John is standing on the right there. And then in front of him is his little brother, Frankie. And Dipna is the little girl on, uh, standing at the front on the left. She was his youngest sister. And he writes a number of these very beautiful letters to his younger sister in the late 50s and early 60s. She's still living at home in this rather difficult household with this tyrannical father. And he's trying to help her. He's trying to give her advice about how to live and what, what mistakes to avoid and so on. So this is an example of one of these letters. You should try to come to terms with the people about you and with your work. If you can't endure them, find devices to avoid them or to see as little of them as possible or to get clear of them altogether. If you dislike your work, set about getting another kind of work. To do any of these things, you'll have to discipline yourself and work. Work is a word that he uses a lot. Work, that work is a kind of salvation. Working hard, working purposefully, you know, being careful with the writing. And that's, he saw himself as a worker, I think. And, and, uh, and, and that's, that's, his, that's his position on the writer's art. There is no such thing in life as freedom. Only the freedom to choose, and that not always. And our choices impose their own tyrannies on us. But only a person who fails, who gives everything up as hopeless, can become wooden. 
now he's going to refer to uh, the the 19th century English writer Charles Lamb, who was famous for his essays. And one of Lamb's essays is um, called The Superannuated Man. It's about retirement. It's about office work, the drudgery of office work, and the freedom of retirement. Lamb didn't let the wood get into his soul. How could one piece of wood say that an office makes people into other pieces of wood? So Lamb had spoken about how when you're working in an office for such a long time that you, you become part of the desk, you know, the wood enters your soul. Only a thinking person could recognize such a thing. I at least have no wish to be a lily of the field. I would not want to be a lesser thing than I am. I can, by discipline and honesty and work, be greater. To give up is to go in the direction of the lily or the piece of wood or the pig, to lose our consciousness or our souls. It is only because your mind has some idea of beauty that a lily is more so than a pig. I was glad to know that you are reading. Read many books. Not until you have read many books, bad ones and good ones, will you know what you want. And always read what you enjoy. But now that you are young, read several and many books, because even now the time is slipping away from you that leaves a lasting impression on your life. Until you have read many books, do not have too many opinions about them because it is only by comparison that books, no more than most things, are good and bad. But ask yourself sometime if this or that has anything to do with your own life. Is it your idea of truth or of beauty? And John McGarren was a, a great reader. Um, my own book, Touchstones, was really about McGarren's reading and the way that various writers influence him, uh, his thinking and his writing style. Um, and he was, you know, often you see in his letters recommending certain books to others. And he was a harsh judge of writing. You know, he, the writers, there were certain writers he admired unstintingly. So people like, for instance, uh, Chekhov, uh, he loved his short stories or the early James Joyce, especially Dubliners, W.B. Yeats almost completely. He, he absorbed all of. So he was a great, a great reader. And so he was encouraging Dimpney here to do the same thing. Now, I mentioned Charles Monteith. Um, sorry for the quality of this photograph, but Charles Monteith is the very tall man on the left here. The man on the far right is the English novelist William Golding. And this is the day on which Golding is awarded no the Nobel Prize for Literature, which I think is 1983. Golding's most famous book is Lord of the Flies, but he wrote several other wonderful novels. And Monteith was responsible essentially for finding Golding. He was another one of his discoveries. And Monteith had this wonderful talent for finding new writers. So this is John McGarren's very first letter to Monteith. His extract from the novel had appeared in the literary magazine X. Monteith had read it and written to him a short note saying, you know, what, can I see some more of your work? Now, I was very, uh, I was helped enormously by the fact that the Faber archives in London are extremely well maintained. And I was given complete access to them. And they, so they had all the copies of McGarren's letters to Monteith and all the copies of Monteith back to McGarren. So that allowed me to watch that conversation and friendship grow. So here's John's very first letter to him. And you can imagine how exciting it must have been for this young Irishman to get a letter out of the blue from the most powerful editor in the most prestigious publishing house in London. Thank you for your letter of the 14th of March concerning the extract that appeared in X. It is the first novel that was actually accepted for publication, but by then I could not in conscience publish it without serious revision. The pieces in X are part of the revision. In the revising, another novel evolved which owed nothing to the first, and that's the novel that's becoming The Barracks. I felt I must leave the revision aside for a time and finish and try to publish this new work. The publishers do not seem to like this delaying and I'm not happy with the position. I sent the first part of this new work to the editors of X who have just written to say that they consider it a real advance and exciting. Whether this opening, 13,000 words or so, would be too slight for you to make me an offer or not, I do not know. If you consider it possible, I could let you see a copy. I hope this does not seem all confusion. I am not bound by any contract or agreement. Naturally, the idea of you publishing me is enormously attractive. 
as it would be, of course. I mean, another reason it was very attractive is that one of the writers that John most admired was then still on the board of directors at Faber, and that was the great poet T.S. Eliot. Um, moving on then, um, this is another letter that I'm very fond of, uh, that I think reveals the true nature of McGahern's character. He became friendly with another Irish writer, an older man called Michael McLaverty from Belfast. He admired several of McLaverty's novels, and he starts writing to him in the late 1950s, and they enter into a very interesting correspondence. Again, I was lucky in that that correspondence is, is maintained in full in a library in Belfast, the Linen Hall Library, and kept there very well. It was a very enjoyable place to work. Um, here he's talking about a prize. He, he wins a prize for, for a part of the barracks in 1962. And it's quite a prestigious prize. It's the most prestigious Irish literary prize of the time. It's called the A.E. Prize. A.E. was an Irish poet of the early 20th century, also known as George Russell. And he's talking here about the excitement of winning the prize, but then the sudden realization that, that, that excitement is somehow misplaced, that the work must continue. And I think this really, of all the letters, I think this catches McGahern most uh, precisely. For a little while, the morning it came, I was excited as a schoolboy with the award. And then afterwards, there was the blank, inscrutable face of my work that knows nothing of awards or rewards, but only faith and passion and suffering and the long availability, which we call work, will move. The most gladness my success, if so little can be called that, has brought, apart from my friend's sake, is to affirm in my bones that all success and failure are private. What happens outside that are either lucky or unlucky accidents, for all art approaches prayer. Now, what does he mean by that, that last sentence especially? McGarren was still a practicing Catholic at this time, although moving away from the church. So when he says that all art approaches prayer, he doesn't mean it in the sense of a kind of formal Catholicism. He means that writing is a religious activity. Religious in the sense that we're questing for answers to the most difficult questions of our existence. Why are we here? What ought we to do? What comes next? You know, what is this all about, this world, this life? And I think probably all great writers are religious in that sense. They're seeking the answers to, the, to life's most difficult questions of our very existence. Okay. Um, this is a more business-like letter, but I think it's a very important one. Um, as I said before, the, the history of John's American publishing is very complex. Um, this is his third book, Nightlines, a collection of short stories published in 1970. It was published, as usual, in London by Faber, but in America, it was going to be published by uh, the Atlantic Press. And John it was, was sent a proposed cover of the book by Peter Davison, the editor at the Atlantic Press. And this is, this is it here. Now, I, was, I found this in the Galway papers. And John McGarren hated this cover. He, he hated it so much that he was willing to break with the American publisher if needs be. Why did he hate it so much? Well, his letter explains. My heart fell at the sight of the cover. Impression, a schoolgirl's book, a chocolate green or green chocolate of the pig in the kitchen. My prose stands against everything the cover says. Surely Yeats, Joyce and Beckett gave Irish letters some universal dignity. I might let it pass if I thought it would find its readers. My experience is that people likely to buy a book are people who enjoy the language. A cover like that is the same as selling cheese under a sugar label. That hankering after the little old homestead is played out. Grove have no need of it. The cover is lazy, unimaginative, and it's stereotypes, since whoever designed it thought it a cliché, a long dead one at that. Why can't it just get decent type and red and black? If nothing can be better thought of. That cover is death to the book. Gregory wouldn't have let it through. I don't want to hear the viciousness in his laugh when he sees it. And you, as a poet, as well as a publisher, must be able to see it's a disaster. 
That kind of Irish cover has been literally played to death and is as dead as the literature it symbolised. Lovely mists that do be rising on the bog, top of the morning. I'll be back at 1 Rue Christine on the 1st of October. Can you write to me? Forgive any mistakes. I am disturbed. So he hated this cover because it played into all of the old stereotypes about Ireland. Primitive, peasants, a thatch cottage in the background, an old woman with her shawl. And if you read the stories that make up Night Blind, none of them have anything to do with this. None of them. He's absolutely right about this cover. It's an Irish, an Irish American sentimentalism and cliche about what they want Ireland to be. And Ireland isn't like that anymore, if it ever was. Um, here, in fact, are, he, won, he won the argument. And the image on the left is the American edition of Nightline. As you can see, he got his way, type, just type, typescript on the front. And on the right is the British edition of Nightline. These are the sorts of covers that he wanted. He did not like decorative covers. And he hated, obviously, that one of the old lady walking away from the cottage. OK, um, I'm, I'm going to move on well ahead into 1999. This is an interesting letter uh, to a man called Joe Kennedy. This is a photograph, Joe Kennedy on the left, John McGarren on the right, taken in about 1975 in Cork. I wanted to include this one because the way I found the Joe Kennedy letters was extremely lucky. I was visiting Madeleine McGarren for a couple of days, asking her a whole series of questions that had, had arisen in my research. While I was there, the, the name Joe Kennedy had come up in one letter. Now, one letter amongst, you know, 1,500 letters, just one little mention. And I asked Madeline, did she know who Joe Kennedy was? And she said, yeah, he was a journalist friend of ours, but she had no information about him. She couldn't remember who he worked for. And I just thought, OK, I'll move on. That's, that's not going to, I won't bother with a footnote. I'll just leave it there. By pure luck. The next day, a letter arrived at Madeline's house from Joe Kennedy. Now, she hadn't seen Joe Kennedy in 13 years. He attended John's funeral in 2006. That was the last time she'd seen him. A letter arrives. Uh, so I now have an address for Joe Kennedy. So I wrote to Joe Kennedy and we arranged to meet in a hotel in Dublin. And we had a cup of tea and then he opened up this attache case. And he said, would these be any help to you? And he had 90 letters in the attache case, 90 letters. And that I never knew existed from John to him between about 1963 and 2005. So it was, it, was, it was a great stroke of luck. This is one of the more interesting letters to Joe Kennedy. Joe had sent him um, an extract from a book in which the Irish short story writer, Frank O'Connor, is writing to the editor at the New Yorker, his friend William Maxwell. And he's, he's talking about this prize that McGahern won, the AE prize. So, and he's rather dismissive of McGahern. So Joe Kennedy sends this to John and says, can you remember any of this? What was this about? And here's the letter. The literary stuff doesn't matter. Literary reputations last as long as the body of work they represent remains useful. Whether to one reader or to many, and will disappear into the long night like ourselves eventually. What matters is the spirit to which they give utterance. Like many things that come my way, I was once part of. Uh, the enclosure is both accurate and inaccurate. I attended that party in O'Connor's flat. This is Frank O'Connor. I went reluctantly. Elizabeth Cullinan, Betty, needed an escort. She was uh, an Irish American writer that he was friendly with and who had worked for the New Yorker also. <coughs> I wasn't even her boyfriend. She was in the middle of a bad love affair. It was the one time I met Frank O'Connor and he remained in bed throughout my stay, which wasn't long. The prize was the AE Memorial. The barracks wasn't published then. The English man was almost certainly Philip Edwards, professor of English at Trinity. Thomas Kinsella was expected to win the AE. He was an Irish poet uh, who died quite recently, actually. I had no hope and only entered at Charles Monteith's insistence. Faber offered to pay the expenses if I lost. Typing five or six copies of an unfinished novel, having it typed was expensive then, but it absorbed most of the 100 pound prize. 
The edge to O'Connor's remark was due, I imagine, to a TV interview I gave on winning the prize. I was asked, what do you think of O'Connor and O'Fuelon? Now, O'Connor and O'Fuelon would have been the two big Irish writers of the time. It was like asking a young writer now, what do you think of Heaney and Friel? I replied blithely, I don't think about them at all, thinking with a young person's conceit that I had adroitly avoided the question. Elizabeth C. told me that O'Connor had watched the interview and that I couldn't have said a worse thing. So much for conceit. I also said Beckett and Kavanagh were the two living Irish writers I most admired. Kavanagh had attacked everybody, including O'Connor and O'Fallon. I read a long, sad attack by O'Connor on Beckett about the same time. My response was an unfair young person's response, and I would prefer it to have been different. I think O'Connor's early work particularly his first book and the first parts of his autobiography is good work. Too late, too little, and it probably wouldn't have done them either. So I think that letter is revealing of, McGarren was a very harsh judge of others' writers, uh, of other writers, uh, and he, he, he couldn't lie. He, he, if you asked him, what do you think of this book? He'd tell you. He'd tell you the truth. He'd tell you what, what he thought of it. And sometimes other writers couldn't take that. Um, so that was probably one of the more interesting letters to Joe Kennedy. I'm going to look at one more letter because I'm conscious that I'm, I'm uh, running up against time here. This letter he writes to a friend of his in Galway, a poet, Michael Gorman, and he writes it after discovering that he uh, is going to die, that he has terminal cancer, which he kills him eventually in March 2006. And I think, again, it shows the kind of inner strength and humor of McGahern in the face of death. Thank you for your letter and the two tempting truffles and the Sligo photos. I love those old photos. They look at you out of a depth of time, but there was no dear Paddy Moran. This was a, an old friend of John. He would be with Sligo Rovers and the old band seems to be in operation. There's not too much difference here other than the adjustment to a different reality, a reality we always knew was there and unavoidable, but is still different when it comes. I used to have ways of avoiding going to the room to write, disliking the intensity and total absorption. But now I'm glad of it. It belongs more to now than when we felt free in acres of time. And that too was necessary and is. I find I have to be socially more careful. All society excludes this knowledge in order to, to function. There was a do for an old friend of mine, Alf Rowley, a barman in Mohol, two years ago. He was dying. And the function was to help pay bills. He lived less than a week afterwards. He had a fine singing voice. And at the end, before the soldier's song, he rose and thanked them and then sang, I bid you all a fond goodbye. There wasn't a stampede for the door, but it was the next best thing. And mutterings about the poor man not being in his right mind, the Leitrim way of describing a lack of tact. So McGarren faced death stoically. Um, in fact, he, he actually wrote a great deal in those final years. He wrote his autobiography, memoir, which looks mainly at his childhood uh, and doesn't, doesn't tell us very much about his writing life. Hopefully the book that I'm now working on, his biography, will expand on all of that and tell us a great deal more. Uh, just to conclude, um, the book was received very well when it was published and it's, it's got great reviews, I'm, I'm happy to say both in Ireland and amongst the British, you know, newspapers like the London Review of Books and the Times Literary Supplement. Um, it very briefly, as you can see on the left, went into the top 10 hardback nonfiction books in Ireland, which is, it, it, I'm delighted about that because, you know, this is not, as I've said before, a book that you read by the swimming pool. You know, it's uh, for a book like this to sell in the thousands is great. And it, it's, a very, it's been a very different sort of experience for me. You know, the books I've published in the past have been with university presses like Oxford and Liverpool. And, you know, they're a smaller run and it's a smaller audience and so on. Because of McGarren's popularity in Ireland, and he's still very much revered in Ireland, this book sold well. It got reviewed everywhere. Uh, I've had many invitations to come and speak, uh, like today, both in Ireland and Britain. And uh, I've got events coming up in, in, in Paris and in, and in Belgium and the United States. Um, and I hope that it opens McGarren up to a new audience, as, as in this case, I hope, with your audience in Egypt, that, it, that 
you know, that people start to read McGahern perhaps who didn't have an opportunity before. Because I think, I think if you want to understand Irish life post-war, post-1950, McGahern gives a fantastic insight to how life operated. And the way life was changing from a very conservative, Catholic-dominated country into a more liberal, uh, open um, uh, world. Um, and McGarren suffered in those years of change. He, he, got, he got banned, he got fired. And he's a, he's a very important figure, I think, in the emergence of a modern, liberal, secular Ireland that we have today. So I will leave it there. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Professor Frank. This is this was very illuminating, actually. And please, anyone, if you have any questions, would you please uh, ask them or share them to the chat box? Okay, I guess we have a bit of a shy audience. I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Of course. The first question is about editorship and committing to this kind of work. I mean. This, of course, wasn't an easy task by all means, going through all the letters, categorizing them and seeing like the common link between them. So if you can comment on this and the difficulties you faced, if any. And another question, what made you decide what letter is important to be included and what is not as important and it should be left out? OK. So editing, uh, yes, it's, it's, it's a very big task. Um, now, I was fairly certain from the beginning that I could at least contain what was coming at me. So, for instance, lots of writers, if, if you take W.B. Yeats, for instance, his, his letters are currently being edited by Professor John Kelly in Oxford, uh, who was one of my supervisors back years ago. And so far, John, John Kelly started that work in 1980. And he's still, he's, so far, he's only halfway. So he knows that he's going to die trying to do the job. And he told me that years ago. He, he laughs about it, you know. Um, so because, you know, Yeats wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of letters, as, as did most, say, 19th century writers. You know, for a 19th century writer, letters are what we do now in email and texts, right? And WhatsApp. Let, let, so you know, how, how many WhatsApps do you send a day? How many emails do you send a day? That, you know, you've sent thousands and thousands, right? That's what letters were in the 19th century. So thankfully with McGahern, McGahern actually didn't write that many letters. Um, you know, the, I, I only found about 1,600 letters, okay? okay. Um, uh, now that might seem like a lot, but it's not really compared to someone like Yates, right? Or, or Joyce or, you know, like an English politician like Gladstone, you know, where you can never finish reading his letters. There's so many of them. So at least it was that. And I was very keen. I didn't know, I wanted to publish it as one volume. So for instance, the Yates letters have come out in five volumes so far, and there will be at least five more, okay? I wanted to do one volume and I managed to do that. Um, so some of the questions that arose in editing, um, you know, when I'm thinking about what, what do I need to write a note about? So I felt I needed to write a note about any, anybody who, who is John, who is Mary, who is Brian, you know, who are these people? Right. And I tried to find out as much as I could about them, you know, what, what's their significance here? Um, uh, then there were some events that I wondered about, should I write a footnote or not? So for instance, in one letter, he mentions <coughs> the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, I think. And I thought, <coughs> do I need to write a footnote about that? Or can I assume that everybody knows? He doesn't say Cuban Missile Crisis. He says, he mentions Cuba. So I think, it, do I need to tell the reader what he's talking about here. And I decided in that case that I did um, because uh, one of his stories uses the Cuban Missile Crisis as a kind of background. Plus, you know, I know what the Cuban Missile Crisis was, but I, I suspect my students maybe don't. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And so I had to decide who's the, who is the reader of this book. And what I decided was that the ideal reader of this book is somebody who hasn't yet been born. Uh, you know, it's somebody a hundred years from now who wants to understand John McGahar. And they take this book down from a library bookshelf and they start to read it. I, for the same reason, I also decided to write a footnote about the 9-11 the attacks. So John McGahern's wife, Madeline, was flying from Heathrow to New York when, the, when those planes hit the World Trade Center. Okay, so her plane turned back to London. He mentions this in a letter. He doesn't say anything about the attacks. He doesn't say anything about, all he says was, you know, I hope turning back to London wasn't too much of a nuisance or something like that. So I thought I, I need to write a footnote. So I wrote a footnote about the 9-11 attacks. Now it was short. I said, here are the facts. This is what happened that day. But that, that is, I think, one of, the, one of the problems with editing. You know, how much do you tell? How much? Because you could, you could get lost in information, you know? So it's trying to get that balance right. And I don't know whether I got it right or not. I, I, I tried to. I tried to get that balance right. And only the reader can decide whether, whether I did or didn't. Yeah. Um, as regards your question about which letters did I leave out, I, I only really left out letters that were very brief or, had, or that were repetitive, in, in which he had said something the same before. So, you know, something like, say, that the letter that I read out to his sister, Dimpna, to me, that was golden. That was an absolutely golden letter. I would never consider leaving something like that out. What I might consider leaving out is a short letter where he's writing to one of his American publishers about uh, royalties, say, or, you know, uh, it, 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 that actually wasn't a difficult decision for me to make. Um, th those, those short kind of business-like letters, some of, many of which are in the book because I, anything that added a new piece of information, I put in. But if it was repetitive, I left it out. Okay, thank you. And as a reader, I, I, I'm glad to tell you that you were balanced. Whatever sure. info I needed to find, I could find it there. <laughs> we have a question in the chat box. Um, it says, did anyone study his religious preference or beliefs? Yes. Um, uh, the, the best critic on that question is a man called Eamon Maher. That's, his, his, that's spelled, um, let me see if I can, can I put that in chat? I don't know if I can. Right. Eamon Maher. So M-A-H-E-R is his surname. And his first name is Eamon, E-A-M-O-N, Eamon Maher. Eamon Maher has written a whole book about uh, McGahern and Catholicism. Um, there's also a very good book uh, by a man called James White. That's W-H-Y-T-E, which looks a lot at Joyce's interest in the, the, uh, the psychologist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung. Hmm. And, 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 and McGowan was interested in Jung. And, and that's also, you know, in, in, in the broad sense, religious. Um, so for sure, people have looked at it. Um, but I think there's more to be said. I mean, one of the things I would hope with the letters is the letters should... It's funny, someone said to me after, after the letters were published, they said, oh, you know, are you, going to, are, you go, are you going to write a new book now based on your discoveries in the letters? And I said, no way, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm done with the letters, you know? That's for somebody else to do. Like there is a great deal of new information in this book that should help uh, readers of McGahern, scholars of McGahern, people who want to write articles, people who want to write um, books, PhD theses. Uh, we now know a great deal more about McGahern than we did before the book came out. So that's not, I, I mean, I am going to write, I've decided this book, his biography, one more book on McGahern. Um, uh, but that would be a different sort of book. I mean, there, there, are, there are lots of interesting approaches one might take to McGahern now um, that would, wouldn't have been possible before. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Frank. Actually, I have one more question if, if I don't have questions in the chat box. Yes, I have one more question. Now, yeah. looking at his writings and the kind of criticism that he has received, I often found him described as an existential writer. Mm. Was this matter in any way in his letters, especially the ones to his friends and to his family members? Uh, no. Now, first of all, I, I agree that he is 
uh, at times an existentialist writer. And I think he's, he's particularly influenced by the great French existentialist, Albert Camus. Mm. And Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus, uh, I think, is a book that is on his mind quite a lot, uh, especially in the barracks. Um, uh, but, but he doesn't, he, he doesn't give away anything about existentialism. He doesn't mention it even once in the letters. Um, nor, in fact, does he mention Camus even once in the letters. He's, you know, McGarren was a, was a very secretive man. And uh, the letters are very revealing, but there are still large aspects of him that he just, he doesn't reveal. Hmm. And I don't think he ever revealed to anybody, even in speech. He, he was, uh, I think about that, the, that, the great opening to James Joyce's essay, um, The Day of the Rabblement, one of his, his very first essay, actually, from 1901. He says, no man can be a lover of the true or the good unless he abhors the multitude. Hmm. He, he says the writer must be alone. The writer must be a, so, a solitary figure. Now, I think McGarren believed that very strongly, that uh, you know, he went and lived in this very rural place. Um, he would spend long months there with just Madeline. He could be sociable, and everyone tells me that. And I, I met him myself, and I found him a very nice, sociable man. But ultimately, he had this kind of, I think, steel in his soul, um, a, a kind of melancholy that was there from his childhood. Um, and he had to work alone. And so he's very private, very, very private. And, you know, lots of people in their reaction to these letters have said to me, you know, I can't believe these exist. You know, I can't, I would have thought he, you know, he would have destroyed everything. Or, and, and to some degree, I think that's true. But I was, I was very pleased with how much I was able to find out that we didn't know before, the private side of him. But, but no, he doesn't, he doesn't, he does talk about other writers and his admiration for other writers. But at no point does he talk about existentialism. But I've no doubt that it's there. I think he is. I think existentialism is an important part of his imaginative makeup. Okay, thank you so much. We actually have one question in the chat box. Do we have an electronic copy of the book of letters we are talking about? Is it available for study? I guess it's available as a Kindle. I, I, I think it must be available as an ebook because I, I, I was looking in our library, our university library here recently, and they have they have it as an ebook as well as hard copy. So it must be available as an ebook. Okay, thank you. Actually, if you don't mind, I have uh, other two, like two couple sure. of questions. A couple sure. of questions and I'm going to stop talking. Yeah. Okay. Um, there is this kind of recurrent idea of a serious writer versus someone who is not serious. Mm. And as you mentioned more than once that he was a harsh critic or a harsh judge of other writers. Now, would this be attributed to him being a writer or a good reader? Like in his letters to his sisters, for example, uh, to his sister, he often talked about the kind of quality of books that she's reading, mm -hmm. and she has to read as many as she can. And yeah. then the comparison between good and bad could, could be there. So if you can just comment on that. He has a very interesting essay called The Solitary Reader. Okay. And it's in a book, uh, a book of his essays was published after his death. I think it was published in 2009, and it's called Love of the World. Okay. And there's an essay in there called The Solitary Reader, where he talks about reading as an occupation. And he mm -hmm. talks about a moment in everyone's life where we begin reading as children. And what we're interested in is the story. We're interested in, you know, fairy tales and, you know, whether the wolf eats the girl or stories that the plot. Then he says, a, a certain point comes in, in our life where if we're to become serious readers, we have to, in a way, forget about the story and think about the style. Okay. That, it's, that it's the quality of the writing um, that makes serious writing. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, he says that the way he writes is that he, 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 he doesn't begin with plot. He doesn't begin with character. He begins with an image, a particular image that won't go away from him. And he has to write about that image and start to expand upon a, that particular image. And uh, that actually that essay, which it's, he writes this essay called The Image. 
which, which you'll also find in Love of the World. It's the closest thing he comes to writing a manifesto. It's very short. It's only about a page and a half. Okay. Um, um, but yeah, it's, it's that move. The serious writer and the serious reader is the writer and the reader that becomes more interested in style, rhythm, um, imagery, and, and not, you know, it's not, the, the plot is no longer the, the most important thing. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask uh, Dr. Rania, please go ahead. Um, sorry, Dr. Rania, you can, you can ask your question. I'll ask after you're done, if you like. Hmm. Um, I was just going to, to mention something like, while you mentioned that he had many letters uh, with his publisher in favor, yes. did this inform us in a way about the writing process that he used to go through before writing his books and so on, like deleting or adding or omitting? Did he care about or did he always have the audience in mind or the publishing industry and so on? Yeah, those letters are very revealing of the process of writing. And, and the book in general, I think, is very revealing of the the actual nuts and bolts, the process of writing, you know, the changes one needs to make. There are a number of letters here, for instance, to his editor at the New Yorker magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was quite successful at the New Yorker. He published a number of stories there in the late 70s and early 80s, a woman called Frances Kiernan. And you can see that he works with her and he's happy to take her suggestions. And he was also happy to take Monteith's suggestions at Faber. Um, and uh, I, I spent the best part of a year once working through the dra his drafts in Galway. And he just, I mean, they're he changes things so, there's one short story called Christmas from about 1965. It's a, it's, it's a little story, six or seven pages. He writes 24 different versions of that. And they're all there in the archive. Most of them handwritten. It's incredible. It's, it's incredible, the process. Now, that's a research project that somebody ought to do at some point, which is what we call a kind of genetic reading of McGahern. You know, look at every version of something and how does it change? Why does it change? I'm not going to do that. I haven't got the patience to do it. But somebody should, and somebody will eventually. I mean, it's there to be done. Um, but yeah, he was an extraordinary rewriter. And you do get a good sense of that in the letters of the actual, the nuts and bolts of the editing job of a writer, yeah. Yeah, I guess in that sense, he's really influenced by Flaubert. Very uh, much, yeah. Yes, I remember yeah. Flaubert at one point, he spent the whole day writing half a page or something. Yeah, yeah. Madame... absolutely, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Flaubert thought he had done a good day's work if he managed to write a sentence. <laughs> I know this. <laughs> I know this. So, Dr. Renier, you had a question? Please go ahead. Well, now that we're talking about decentering, and more recently, Irish studies is going global, so today there is the conversation um, of global Irish studies. So with early career research, which we're trying to support through the Research Center for Irish Studies here in Egypt, Africa, and um, the Middle East, if someone was to look at McGarren's work, where would they begin? And what perspective would they take being outside or beyond the borders of Europe? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think writing is, is universal. Um, I, I don't think it matters. Uh, the, the, the great writing is, is, is a universal language. Um, so, you know, one of your students might be studying McGarren, or they might be studying Flaubert, or they might be studying a British or an American or an Australian or a Russian writer. Um, where would they start with McGarren? Um, well, I still think that there's lots to be said about, about McGarren, you know, about uh his influences or the people he influences so for instance i think the right the irish writers that come after mcgarren people like colm tobin who i mentioned early on there is deeply influenced by mcgarren I, I um uh, or someone like claire keegan who's a, now you know a very successful irish writer she's very much in conversation with mcgarren i think in in her work um one might also take a, a kind of socio-historical approach and look at the way that McGahern um, is the kind of uh, uh, chronicler of a changing Ireland. You know, that he, he moves from this very conservative Catholic dominated landscape into a modern 
secular landscape that he doesn't necessarily welcome, by the way. You know, he he thinks that Ireland has become, you know, brash and vulgar and that there are problems with abandoning tradition and the church and so on, even though he himself had moved away from Catholicism. So I think that's a way you might read him is, you know, alongside the emergence of modern Ireland. Um, um, there, I mean, he, he, he also published lots of, uh, not, not so much in his lifetime, but since then, lots of his radio plays have been published. So you might look at issues of genre, you know, how do his short does his short story write, writing differ from his novel writing? And he, and he does write in that book I mentioned, Love of the World, his essays, about the differences between the novel and the short story. And he argues that the Irish tradition is actually more suited to the short story than to the novel for, for interesting reasons. So uh, it, it, in terms of kind of world literature, another way you might think about it is, our, you know, Ireland as a post-colonial country. Mm -hmm. um, what does Ireland do with the end of colonization? And a book like Amongst Women, which is really largely about his father, is about that. Um, you know, what, what and, you know, someone like Franz Fanon, say, uh, you know, would be a very interesting critic to read alongside McGahern in terms of the emerging post-colonial nation. So there are all sorts of ways I think you might, you might. But look, the most important way, if anyone who's listening to this, um, either here or, or, or in, as a recording, the most important thing is go and read some McGahern pick up one of his novels, pick up one of his novels and see what you think. And I think, you know, if you're a reader and, and you're someone that enjoys literature, I think you're, I think you're in for a real treat. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Professor uh, Chamblin. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll just summarize what we covered today. So basically you started by introducing the books that have been already written by you on uh, McGarren himself, kind of contextualizing and paving the way to uh, your latest one, um, The Letters of John McGarren. And you give us a kind of behind the scene, uh, <laughs> like uh, idea about your relationship with his widow. Um, also, you introduce us to uh, his life and writings, including, including uh, the leave taking, his memoir and his last uh, novel uh, that they may face the rising sun. Also, uh, you should have, you shed some light on uh, his relationship to um, Heaney as the leading Irish poet, and then uh, McGarren himself as the leading novelist, and the cooperation uh, cooperation again with his wife. Then uh, you mentioned that uh, you gave us samples of his uh, letters, um, one to his uh, U.S. editor about his novel *The Dark*, and then insight to his commitment to his writing vocation that were very clear. Another example was the letter um, provided by, to his uh, sister and where he gives her kind of advice about life in general and about work and his concept of work. Um, also, there was something very interesting, the intertextual reference to other writers while he gave her advice. Mm -hmm. Another uh, letter that was very telling also was his first letter to um, Charles Montieth and um, other letters as well. Uh, like to his uh, to Peter uh, Davison, uh, an example of a business letter which outlines reasons for his rejection of a subjected book cover, which was very telling again, telling us about how he feels about these kind of stereotypes. And one more letter was to uh, his friend John Kennedy, uh, sorry, Joe Kennedy. Um, and you give us an idea about how you came to know about the letters and the mere coincidence of mm. fight, like uh, his wife, sorry, his widow receiving a letter and a total of 90 letters that you got from Kennedy. And um, you ended with uh, a talk about the book and its reception, both in Ireland and um, abroad. And you were generous enough to answer our questions, our never ending questions. And you ended up with suggestions for venues of research. Uh, one of them is his influence uh, on other writers, the socio-historical approach, looking at him as a, chronicle, uh, a chronicler of uh, Ireland. And another thing was to look at Ireland as a post-colonial country and your um, actually valid suggestion of reading him alongside uh, Franz Fanon and his books on post-colonialism. And um, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Rania, for giving me the opportunity to, to meet Professor Shovlin and uh, to be with you today. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for inviting me. And uh, I'm delighted to, 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 to be able to be 
part of your of your research seminar series and uh, good luck with uh, the rest of your term. Well, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank um, our um, our guests this afternoon. We have um, academic staff uh, from Mainchens University, Dr. Ines Lebrosi. We have Dr. Omnay Al Umus um, from the British University in Egypt, and we have Dr. Mervet Shukri. Thank uh, you. Our head of department, and we also have Dr. Mehdi Bailey, and we also have Dr. Sarah Hegezi um, from different um, from the British University as well as um, state. Um, universities across across Egypt. Um, Professor Frank Shovlin, it's been an honor. Um, today's topic was quite insightful. It is a new topic for us um, in this um, part of the world. <laughs> um, and it's um, your, your detailed um, uh, discussion this afternoon was insightful. And Dr. Hoda Al Hadri, as a moderator, um, and thank you very much. Your questions also helped open channels of discussion for our early career researchers uh, in Egypt, Africa, and the Middle East. Thank you, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you in future seminars with our best compliments from the Research Center for Irish Studies, Faculty of Arts and Humanities at the British University in Egypt.